Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table, where we discuss issues of God and culture, and our topic today is a comparison between Protestantism and Roman Catholicism. We're going to talk a lot about the history of the development of the Roman Catholic Church and some of the differences that exist between Catholics and Protestants because sometimes uh, people are not aware of the differences that exist and why we have uh, Roman Catholicism on the one hand and Protestantism on the other. Uh, I am Daryl Bach, Executive Director of the Howard G. Hendricks Center for Christian Leadership and Cultural Engagement, and I am um, Executive Director of Cultural Engagement for that wing of the center. And to my right is Scott Harrell, who is a doctor and professor of systematic theology here at Dallas Theological Seminary. And to my left is Michael Spiegel, who is also a doctor and a professor of systematic theology at Dallas Theological Seminary. So I'm surrounded by full-blown Truly theologians today. I'm, I, you know, here I am, this little Bible reader, and the, I've got these uh, theologians to my right and my left. So anything that I say can and will be used against me in a court of law. <laughs> Uh, so uh, thank you, gentlemen, for coming in to discuss this topic. We've been wanting to do this for some time. Thanks. Uh, we're going to begin by talking first about Catholics and Protestants and just getting some statistics in front of you so you understand the relative sizes and makeup of the groups. And for that, uh, Dr. Harrell has brought his trusty pie charts. And uh, so uh, give a, tell us uh, some of the issues between Catholics and Protestants in terms of size of groups and that kind of thing. Well, it is interesting. The Pew Forum uh, just in January, published some things along this line. You have, you have about 1.1 billion professing Catholics in the world, maybe a little more than that, 1.2. Uh, what is interesting is the demographic shift all around the world. In, in 1910, 65% of the Roman Catholics in the world were in Europe. Uh, that has dwindled down to about 34% today. And uh, 24%, excuse me, and uh, the, the group in Latin America has grown significantly, as one might expect, with population and all of that. But from 1910, when there were less than 1% Roman Catholic in sub-Sahara Africa, today there are 16% of the world Catholics are in sub-Sahara Africa. Hmm. The Asian rim has also grown rather extraordinarily, too, from less than, well, about 5%, thinking of the Philippines and other countries like that, or in India, there's still a sizable church, a Roman Catholic church, to now 12% of the world's Catholics are in Asia and the Pacific Islands. Uh, the United States has always been or I should say North America, rather slender here. Uh, in 1910, we were about 5% of the world Catholicism, and today it remains about 8%. What is interesting in, in the United States is that the number of, let's say, Caucasian uh, Catholics is seeing significant fall away, whether into non-religion or whether into uh, other groups. What is Keeping the ranks uh, fairly healthy is the immigration, particularly mm -hmm. from Latin America. So lots of fascinating things are happening in the world today as uh, we now have a new pope as well. Now, you said, uh, I, you, did you mention the Latin American population of Catholics and what its, its makeup is? I don't know. Latin America is surely, far and away, the largest uh, group of Roman Catholics today. That's about 40% of world Catholicism. And there's something of an ebb and flow. Largely, there's been a drift either towards secularism or, or even into evangelicalism, particularly Pentecostalism, neo-charismatic movements. There is, uh, there is concerted effort, on the other hand, by the Roman Catholic Church to, to stop the flow and indeed gain many back in. And one example is, of course, uh, now Francis I, our first Latin American pope from Buenos Aires, Argentina, faithful as a, as a conservative Catholic through it all. And one of the first events now that he's launching is a World Youth Day, a Roman Catholic World Youth Day, which happens about every two years. But that is staging in Rio. And the, the uh, interestingly, the advertisement for it, which my wife regularly watches on, mm. on, uh, online, is, is almost completely what we would call evangelical. 
talking about how we as as a Catholic church need, needs to be reaching out and proclaiming the love of Christ and much, much more. So there is a, there is an effort to redraw youth uh, back into the church. And one more example. Okay. There is a very charismatic Roman Catholic priest, uh, uh, Marcello Berti, in Sao Paulo, and he is well known for his speaking as well as his singing with kind of a rock band in the background or very much Latin popular music. He's just built a, a huge cathedral in Sao Paulo. It's called the Mother of God. It seats 6,000. 14,000 can also be there standing up. Outside are the huge screens, which accommodates another 80,000 people. Hmm. There is a strong desire to draw uh, Brazil and, of course, other Latin American countries back into the fold for the Roman Catholics. Just quickly, why don't you summarize uh, the time that you spent in Latin America so that people know that you have direct uh, contact with that part of the world. Sure. Uh, I started out in Porto Alegre in the very far south. Uh, which has a well-known south, of. south uh, sorry, as far south as you can go in Brazil. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so we're about straight across from Johannesburg, South Africa, the largely German Italian area with a very large Roman Catholic uh, constituency. Uh, many trained even in Germany elsewhere, Leonardo Boff and others out of that area. Then I moved to São Paulo, and I was there a, a total, my wife and children and I, a total of about 18 years, hmm. taught across the street from the huge Pontifical University uh, in Sao Paulo with about 40,000 students. So when Argentina plays Brazil, you root for Argentina? Plays Brazil? Yeah. In no, are you kidding? <laughs> Brazil all the way, sure. Oh, okay. yeah. oh wow. No, Ar Argentina in that sense are our arch enemies unless uh, they make it into the finals. There too, you go. So. Okay. And we're good. not, so we'll vote for them. So, so, you, so you've attached yourself to Brazil and are, are, have Brazilian soccer blood. Rather thoroughly. Yeah, okay. Very good. Well, now that we've got your theological pedigree <laughs> thoroughly, uh, thoroughly presented, Michael, why don't you talk a little bit about the history of – Catholicism and Protestantism, sure. and by which I mean here the Reformation. Let's mm -hmm. talk a little bit about the Reformation, where it came from, and sure. and uh, what Luther was reacting to, and actually what Luther was was still comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Good, yeah. W when we talk about Roman Catholicism, we have to always ask the question of when are we talking about it, where are we talking about it, and who are we talking about. So the things that Martin Luther, for instance, were responding to. Uh, more or less don't exist anymore. The church itself, the Catholic Church, has gone through several reforms of their own and several uh, phases of evolution themselves. So what Luther was responding to primarily, and even some of his predecessors, we think of uh, Wycliffe and Huss as well, and some, some ma many, many others going back to the 13th and centuries and earlier, uh, Luther was responding to a Roman Catholic Church that was very much uh, part of the social political structures. Uh, the, they had doctrines and practices that had developed contrary even to their own um, uh, official pronouncement centuries earlier. And so you're seeing in the 13th, 14th century Roman Catholic Church uh, what Roman Catholics today would see as uh, av actual um, uh, moves away from the intended stream of their tradition. What Luther was responding to primarily uh, was the Catholics' doctrines of uh, salvation, justification, especially uh, their abandonment of what Luther thought was the Augustinian view of salvation. And we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, abuses, the um, uh, luxurious lives of the popes and the papacy and uh, the functioning of the papacy uh, too close to the world. And so a lot of these things that many, many people, including Roman Catholics, were outraged about. Uh, and Roman Catholics today would see those excesses as unacceptable. Um, substantially, the main essence of what Luther eventually settled on was the doctrine of justification, uh, as he saw um, better understood in Paul's writings as well as in the history of the early church. Surprisingly, what Luther was very comfortable with um, – was a very high view of the of the Lord's Supper, and we we'll probably discussed that a little bit. wasn't exactly the same as the Roman Catholic view of transubstantiation, but it was 
much higher than many Protestants and evangelicals. So the difference have been. between the elements becoming the body of blood and the and if I can say the elements being surrounded by the right, presence right. of Christ. Exactly. Okay. Um, so he was comfortable with that. He had a very high view of the church uh, and the function of the church. Uh, infant baptism did something. Um, the he had. Uh, you know, the the big deal was justification by faith, by grace through faith alone, and then the hierarchy of the church and the authority of the pope. Which led to Luther's emphasis on the priesthood of all believers. Exactly, right. Okay. Well, we will come back to these two areas in, in more detail in a minute. Let me put one other term or – a set of terms in front of you and let you both uh, play with them a little bit. Sometimes we discuss, and this isn't just a Catholic Protestant discussion, but generally in thinking about ecclesiology, we'll talk about the difference between what we call high church and low church. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, what what do those terms suggest, and where, generally speaking, does Roman Catholicism fall on that scale, if I can say it that way? Is it, is well, high church would be would be typically a church with a strong hierarchy, mm-hmm. top down, and a strong liturgy uh, that would that would be fairly universal. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church would be the highest of the high churches okay. with its formality <laughs> and uh, the Pope and, and everything down right. through Rome and, and into the rest of the world. The Eastern Orthodox would also be fairly much a high church, though mm-hmm. they don't see themselves quite in that vein, but with their metropolitans or patriarchs as the regional leaders under the, the, the kind of chief amongst those in Constantinople or now Istanbul. So the high church would, would again be that. A hierarchy, liturgy, are stressed. Liturgy so Anglican sated church, with meaning. Episcopalian church, or high, generally speaking, generally, high church. Yeah. There's high, high church. and low mm-hmm. Anglican yeah, churches, that's right. as you well know. Right. Uh, low church would be those which would see a, a, a more uh, uh, lay-oriented and comfortable and and uh, um, uh, uh, a kind of service that would. Uh, be more indigenous to wherever it is with a plurality of leadership sometimes. So a looser form, basically. Surely. Yes. Yeah. And we're talking about a um, – we're talking about an emphasis then uh, as you move from high to low, you, you tend to move in a direction that emphasizes the priesthood of the believer perhaps a little more because everybody's seen to participate. There's less direction from the front in the worship, if I can say it that way. Right. Um, that's well where their liturgy comes from, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Because as we're going to be talking about shortly, when we think about the Roman Catholic Church in particular and its theology and the way in which the church at least mediates or directs in the salvation process and in the service, um, this leads to a sense in which the minister really is a um, – how do I say it – a minister alongside the individual as opposed to the individual being their own entity before God. There's a sense in which the minister uh, uh, minister can minister, can be seen to minister grace mm-hmm. in a way that you don't mm-hmm. see in Protestantism. Mm-hmm. Is that a fair – Summary of what's going on? Yeah, that's a good summary. Uh, One thing with high churches is from church to church, you more or less know what to expect. Mm -hmm. You know who's in charge. There's no question about who's in charge here. Uh, You know that when you walk in, you're going to expect a certain order of worship. There might be slight variety. Uh, but you're, you're talking under, about in high churches. In high churches. Yeah. Low churches, you Who don't knows? know what – right. You, it's, you never know what to expect uh-huh. from church to church, either, even within the same denomination. Uh, but that is also key is the function of the actual church leader, the, the priest or um, the bishop, is really mediating something that you can get in no other way mm-hmm. but through the services and through the mass, through the uh, And this leads to the that idea leader. that the church is the true church because of the way in which the minister um, – how can I say it – is uh, mediates and, and provides access to grace or to blessing in a way That's that, right. generally speaking, you don't hear about in Protestant church, generally speaking. We might add one other thing, and that is the issue of accountability. Mm-hmm. In the high church, there's a very tight – Accountability on down uh, through the hierarchy in the low church, and that can def- that can describe many different kinds of denominations as well as independent churches. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are varying degrees of accountability. Some mm-hmm. hardly any accountability at all. It all orients around the man of God or the pastor, so to mm-hmm. speak, who uh, uh, around which the congregation gathers. Other times, there's more a, a body of Christ plurality of leadership, so a mutual accountability. 
So, uh, and uh, well, I'll, I was going to say there's a structure for accountability, whether the accountability is actually exercised or not. Right. Sometimes, right. given the way, particularly the history, recent history with the Roman Catholic Church uh, and some of the scandals that we've seen, whether it's been whether it's actually executed or not, it's of course an, right. entirely yeah. another matter. Okay, well, let's start off with probably the most obvious difference that exists between Protestants and Catholics, and that is that. Uh, uh, generally speaking, Protestants don't have a pope, uh, it would be fair to say, um, uh, but the Roman Catholic uh, Church does. Let's talk a little bit about the development of the papacy, because I think most people are very unaware of how – and in fact, this is something we're going to see in all the discussion we're going to have how, – how doctrine in the Roman Catholic Church very much develops in uh, over time right. and formalizes as it moves through uh, different phases. This is why I think Michael's point earlier about, mm -hmm. well, when you talk about the Roman Catholic Church, you got to ask kind of the when, where, and who questions. Right. Um, and so uh, let's talk a little bit about the papacy. Um, you know, the claim is, of course, that the Pope is the Vicar of Christ who was given the keys of the kingdom. Uh, in Matthew 16, uh, when uh, Peter confessed that Jesus was the Christ in, in Matthew 16, and that this has uh, been an unbroken line since the time of Peter. I, I, I can distinctly remember being in Rome and walking in the church of, of St. Saint Saint Paul. Yes. Exactly. And, yep. you, and you walk in and you see the row of popes, starting with, with Peter. Peter yeah running all the way through an unbroken line, all the way up, well, at least the la when I was there the last time, of course, it was, it was Pope John Paul II. Um, and they only have space for about three more, I think. <laughs> so. Yeah, I don't think it's a prediction of when Christ is returning. But anyway, but it is, it is, an, interesting, it is an interesting thing to see, to actually walk in there yeah. and see, you know, mm -hmm. one after another, this unbroken line of, of vicars of Christ. Of course, the, uh, the Bishop of Rome, uh, the Pope is the Bishop of Rome, and then the Bishop of Rome is is viewed as the um, how do you want to say it um, uh, among equals. I'm forgetting the first word, um, but anyway, he has primacy over the rest of right. the rest of the cardinals, um, and that's where he in inherits the authority from. So, so that's the claim, if you will. Mm -hmm. What about the history of the development of of the yeah. papacy? And I ask this question because uh, my son. Stephen went to a Roman Catholic uh, University, went to St. John's in, in uh, New York City, and he took a course on the history of the church. And the book that he was assigned was a history of the Roman Catholic Church. It was written by Hans Kung, which meant that he was evaluating this papacy mm -hmm. claim. And literally, I, walk, I read the book while my son was in the class to interact with him, and uh, he actually walks you through this history. It's actually pretty fascinating. So. With that, as a, I think I've set the table for sure. a little bit of discussion. Uh, uh, let, me, let me first say that you know when you walk into St. Paul's outside the wall in that church and you look at that unbroken line, it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it makes things really simple. Uh, the problem is it has to cut a lot of historical corners. Um, what's interesting is the local, the Pope in Rome, the Roman um, Bishop of Rome, originally started out as the. Um, what we might call a pastor of a local church in Rome, presiding over the city churches, uh, small scale. However, the Roman church uh, very, very quickly, already in the New Testament time, grew in power, wealth. By the second century, it was a force to be reckoned with. It had uh, members that were part of the uh, imperial court. And so from the start, uh, the church in Rome had just by virtue of being in Rome, the capital of the empire, a privileged position with uh, finances and power and influence. And so that's just a historical reality. And the, we're a little bit suspicious that the Gospel of Mark may actually be written to or have some association with the Roman Church as well. So, so yeah. we're very early on that it has it very very a influential. And so yes. there's no doubt about that. But it wasn't the only one. There are other. Jerusalem was very influential. Antioch extremely influential. Ephesus for a while. Smyrna, wherever you had. Uh, apostles living for a long time and uh, their disciples. So it was one of many what eventually became – started to be called um, uh, episcopacies, episcopal sees. Um, because major, these are regional hubs. Basically. Right. Regional hubs and usually very, very large cities. So mm -hmm. they had resources. And from these, you had uh, the missionary work uh, flowing from these churches. What's interesting is for the most part, 
everything west of Rome, including Western North Africa, uh, were daughter churches of the church in Rome through mm -hmm. their missionary efforts for several centuries. And so whenever there were problems, whenever there were issues, whenever they needed leadership, they appealed to the mother church in Rome. So really there was no question that in the West, Rome was the mother church just by a historical um, fact. Uh, what happened, though, was there was often a jostling then in, when you get into the third, fourth, fifth centuries between these other major hubs. Mm -hmm. So Alexandria and Egypt mm -hmm. and Jerusalem and Antioch and uh, Rome, and then eventually Constantinople, once mm -hmm, uh, yes. the, you have two capitals of the empire. And so when the church becomes very much intertwined with the political realities, now you have several major cities and major bishops uh, competing for – uh, for prominence. The church in Rome, um, you know, very early on tried to assert that they were, because of Matthew 16, 18, on this rock I will build my church, referring uh, in their understanding to Peter, uh, that they should be the presiding church, the major city. And so yeah, it a, develops then throughout the history from that point. I have a list here. It's, it's interesting. This comes out of a dictionary of, of theology. Um, and um, Victor in 190 um, mm -hmm. rebukes the Asia Minor churches because they don't uh, celebrate Easter on the correct date. Mm -hmm. Um, Stephen, 254 to 257, uh, claims a Petrine deposit. He's actually the first one to make a direct appeal in, in language in a conscious kind of way as he interacts with North African churches that have, have, uh, have heretics who are supervising the sacraments. So, so you see these moves. You see some of this in, the, in, in some of the Apostolic Father letters where Rome is trying to put pressure on Corinth, for sure, example, yeah. and Corinth pushes back. Yeah. So, um, so uh, yeah. these, are, these are important tensions. So it, it's not as clear – you said cut historical corners – it's not as clear in these early days that they have this right or that everyone understands they have this right as much as they're contending for it. Is that, that I would say that's absolutely true, it, and it is important to note that even though the Eastern Orthodox Church, the church in primarily the Greek-speaking church early on in the East, um, acknowledged the importance of Rome and the the, uh, the port importance of the Bishop of Rome as one of the of a confraternity or brotherhood of bishops, uh, they never accepted this supremacy or papal infallibility mm -hmm. or any of the things that Rome obviously uh, came to in the course of history. Uh, so I think it's an important point to realize that this is something that develops, it grows over time. Most of the time it's understandable. Sometimes, you know, it's, it's, uh, it makes sense when mm -hmm. the Roman Empire is being attacked by the Vandals and the, and the uh, Goths and Visigoths, the, the church is there as a stabilizing factor and they did a lot of good, but only afterwards you see the results of that are a very a cozying up between the secular and uh, sacred authorities and this uh, the the Roman Catholic doctrine in the medieval period of the two swords. So they interpret this passage where Peter says, G Peter says to Jesus, "I have two swords," and Jesus says, "That's enough." Well, later exegetes interpret that as saying, "Well, the one sword is the sacred authority; the other sword is the secular authority." Well, I write and a therefore, new section of my commentary. <laughs> exactly. So you know, so this is a case where biblical interpretation is following this developing theology. Now, you mentioned the, the Greek Orthodox Church or the Eastern Church. Um, uh, le, uh, we ought to stop there a little sure. bit because they recognize the Pope as the head of the Western sure. Church, but yes. they do not accept the idea that he has authority in their area, which, which shows a slight difference of approach ecclesiologically. Even mm -hmm. though there's a hierarchy, they, they're contending for an equality that's a little bit more regional, if I can say, even though it's big regions, yeah, yeah. A, a little more regional in the way it's viewed as opposed to one who's over everybody else. Fair, fair enough? I would so, say that's and, fair. And they still look to Jerusalem. They call that the mother church. Which was not presided over by Peter, by the way. Right. James was the head of the Jerusalem Council, we we'll right. recall. So, yeah. So th those are some examples of the historical corners. Now, the papacy the, the, the really begins to formalize. There are decretal letters in the fourth and fifth century. Uh, Leo the Great, four forty to four sixty one. Um, 
begins to really bolster the role and claim it and almost exercise the authority of it. And my sense is, is that he's kind of the, he has he's the first one to identi- to use the term that actually comes out of the Roman Empire directly the the uh, Pontifex, Pontifex Ma- yeah. mm-hmm. Maximus the okay. the supreme mm-hmm. the supreme priest if you want to think of that chief priest you could think of it that way the <laughs> the top dog uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, and so in in that sense we begins to formalize this. But the doctrine really continues to, de- to develop even beyond that. We, once we come into the Middle Evil period, et cetera, um, the date that I have here for the claims of infallibility tied to the Pope, uh, 1059, which is much later, um, the structure of electing the Pope through the College of the Cardinals formalized at that same time period. So much further on down the road, so when are we talking about what's happening right. at a given time? Um, when we come to uh, to uh, the latest development, the Pope speaking ex cathedra, okay, mm-hmm. from the throne, mm-hmm. when he is exercising his ability to interpret infallibly on behalf of the magisterium, which is where we're going to go next, um, uh, that's 18... Uh, 18, uh, 1870. Uh, 70. Yeah. So we're very, very late in the game mm-hmm. <laughs> in the overall scheme of things. But I think walking through that, just walking through that history and seeing the kind of the blocks fall into place shows you part of what we're talking about, that this is a church that has developed its doctrine. It mm-hmm. develops its doctrine around, we're going to be talking about shortly, the magisterium, the, the tradition coming alongside the scripture to develop really the mechanism of the church, the hierarchy of the church, the highness of the church, if we want to mm-hmm. think of it that way. Um, and, and so what we have later on in the history of the church isn't necessarily what we were dealing with early on. Correct. Right. Yeah, yeah and I, I might just mention a resource here, a historical resource, a, a good classic work pretty accessible by most people is a book by Margaret Deansley called The History of the Medieval Church. It basically looks at a period from about 600 to the eve of the Reformation and traces exactly what you described, that development, uh, when do things come in, when do uh, various popes add various uh, levels of authority, and it's, an, it's a very eye-opening study for further study on this. We should, we should probably add here, uh, Daryl, that there have been quite a few missteps by popes as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, Athanasius, the great defender of the Trinity, was, was condemned by Pope Liber- Liberius. Mm-hmm. And, and the list goes on to where you had, at one point, even three popes contending with each other. So there have been some, some sloppy things happening in history. Gregory the first, the Gr- Gregory the Great, right. perhaps yeah, yeah. the right uh, the most most remarkable uh, organizer of the church. He said something interesting. He said that any anyone was the Antichrist who took upon himself the role uh, of the title universal bishop. Hmm. Now that's what Gregory the Great said, mm-hmm. and yet that's the title that virtually all modern popes assume. Yeah, and so. Well, I was going to say that that in 1870, then we take that big step of the the Pope speaking ex cathedra from mm-hmm. the throne, infallible dogma, and that happens very, very rarely. The last time was uh, in 1950. Pope Pius XII uh, proclaimed that as absolute dogma for all Roman Catholics, Mary's physical bodily ascension into heaven. Uh, she did not die, but was rather taken there by her son. Yes, and uh, we'll, when we come to Mary, we're going to discuss the development of, the, of that teaching as well. I, the papal infallibility strikes me in looking at the history, and, and uh, you know, part of the his, part of history is sociology, and uh, um, strikes me as a Catholic Church's reaction to the encroachment of modernism in the church and trying to get control of the doctrine by adding this layer of authority on top of what uh, the, of the way the church operated mm-hmm. as a way of stopping certain encroachments sure. into the church. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, well, that's, uh, that, that's an overview of the papacy. We aren't going to take as long on the other discussions we're going to have, but that's obviously important. Uh, the, the pope is certainly the most visible uh, personal figure 
tied to the Roman Catholic Church, and he may well be the most visible personal figure tied to Christendom worldwide in terms of how people perceive yes. Christianity from the outside, which is why whenever a pope is elected, it's a big deal. It's automatically uh, uh, international news. Everybody covers it. Even CNN and Fox are there together holding hands as the pope <laughs> is elected. And so, um, so it's not an unusual uh, it's not unusual to see a lot of attention drawn because the Pope is such a visible figure. And actually, that's one of the um, – how can I say it? That's one of the sociological elements of the Catholic Church is it is a structured church that has um, some, some logic to the way it's structured, which makes operating under it, at least from the mm -hmm. point of view of the way uh, it looks – um, seem very organized as compared to, say, if I can say this, Protestantism, which mm -hmm. doesn't have a pope, doesn't have a singular church uh, to appeal to, that kind of thing, much more scattered in the way it operates, much less uh, much less organized in the way it functions, right. um, which I think is an important uh, and it's very, sociological And that's very appealing to a lot of people who, are, who do tire out of the – um, disorganization and lack of authority in some of the Protestant traditions. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's shift now to the to that which is uh, to an idea that's very much related to the papacy, and certainly the Pope has responsibility for it in some way, and that is the magisterium. Uh, Scott, what do you understand by the magisterium? What it what is it? Uh, you know, whenever we go to terms that are Latin, we've got to uh, we've got to help most of the people who don't work with the dead language or mostly dead language. And so, um, so what is the magisterium? And uh, and then let's relate it also to the role of scripture and tradition, which is another important difference, I think, between. Mm -hmm. Protestants and Catholics. Protestants will uh, hold up the doctrine of sola scriptura as a as something that is to be affirmed. Uh, and uh, actually, Catholics have a variation of sola scriptura too, but they apply it differently. So how does how does that work? Well, magisterium would be the the official teaching dogmatic body of the Roman Catholic Church. Usually it's related to the, the cardinals and finally the large house, house of cardinals and, uh, and the leading theologians in the movement, but finally that all comes under, under of course, uh, the pope himself. But the magisterium is the authoritative interpreter of not only scripture but Roman Catholic tradition. So, tradition. It is, it is interesting. I have here, Daryl, uh, might be interesting to read out of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Now, you By said way, you're going to mention some resources, so why don't you tell people what that exactly could. that is and if they're interested, where they can get All it, because right. it is a way to get a reference to what the Catholic Church teaches. This is the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It's the second edition. That's important. It was done in Latin in, in 1994, English 1995. You can get it double day. Uh, various editions since then. But this is the official teaching, the official doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church. And I might add, there's an awfully lot in there we will agree with right down the line. Mm -hmm. There is also a, a – this is 800 pages, so uh, whoever wants to read it can. <laughs> there is a 200-page user-friendly version called Compendium mm -hmm. since 2006. The Cliff Notes version. Compendium uh -huh. uh, of, the Roma, of the Catechism of the Roman Catholic mm – -hmm. of the Catholic Church. And that's a lot more accessible. Both are in this question-answer kind of format, so it makes it very easy. Those are some on the Roman Catholic side, and of course many other books out. Uh, those who are uh, evangelicals may want to uh, argue some and look at some of the differences. One is John Armstrong, The Catholic Mystery. This uh, details some of the things where traditionally Protestants and Catholics have differed. Uh, Ronald Zinn as well, another one called Romanism. There are many arguments on many sides, but those are basic helpful uh, books that, that may be useful. The uh, the, the issue of sola scriptura, the great cry of the Reformation, versus scripture plus tradition is perhaps the fundamental difference between Roman Catholicism and uh, Protestantism, evangelicalism. Because everything grows out of the difference in the way in which it's applied. You're talking about it's a hermeneutic, a, a way it of sure doing is. theology. If you say that the, the Holy Spirit has infallibly guided the church, not only to interpret the scriptures, but to interpret the interpretations of the scriptures, mm -hmm. then you may be confessing the bodily ascension of Mary into heaven, well, you surely will be, mm -hmm. as well. 
uh, with the Reformation, as, as Mike has brought out very well, there was an outcry that some of the traditions have surpassed and contradicted the Scripture, mm -hmm. and that's where the rub comes. Here's what the uh, Catholic Catechism does say, and it might be helpful just to hear it. Sacred scripture and sac uh, sacred tradition and sacred scripture then are bound closely together and communicate one with the other, for both of them, flowing out of the same divine wellspring, come together in some fashion to form one thing and move toward the same goal. Now the first talk about sacred scripture is the speech of God. It is put down in writing under the breath of the Holy Spirit. They go on to talk about the inerrancy of the Scripture, mm -hmm. at least regarding issues of saving faith. But then it goes on, and holy tradition transmits in its entirety the Word of God. It comes down through the apostles. One paragraph here, two sentences, is important. As a result, the church to whom the transmission and interpretation of revelation is entrusted, does not derive her certainty about all revealed truths from the Holy Scriptures alone. Both Scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence." Well, that is very interesting, and, and, and because I work in New Testament and work with Second Temple Judaism, it's interesting to hear this juxtaposition of revelation and tradition, mm -hmm. because you see it in Judaism as well in the development of the Mishnah and the Talmud. But it's interesting that in Judaism it's handled differently. Uh, it's not moving towards one authoritative uh, tradition that right. trumps everything else, but what you get is are the voices. In Judaism, mm -hmm. you get the voices of what the various rabbis have said. Now, there certainly is a dominant position, a majority position that's always stated oftentimes at the end of a particular discussion, mm -hmm. but, but you get the conversation um, as opposed to this driving to the singularity. So, so, so there are actually different models of how to deal with revelation and tradition alongside one, one another. And uh, this is an interesting question to probe a little bit, and that is in Protestantism, you know, although we emphasize sola scriptura, there is, there is a sense in which we work – and I'll say this carefully – we work with tradition. Yes even though we distinguish it from Scripture and don't give it an equal status. And that difference is very, very important in this conversation. Is that right? Yeah. Join us next week for part two of The Table Podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.